Hello and welcome back to the AP US History Curriculum for Era 6. In this video, we will be looking at Topic 6.6, .6, The Rise of Industrial Capitalism in the Gilded Age. This is another one for quite questions, but at the same time, we've covered a lot. But let's go ahead and get to it. As we have been looking at in our previous videos, large-scale industrial production expanded tremendously during the Gilded Age, and many new products were developed. Railroads, the oil industry, the steel industry, electricity, and the telephone were all making significant changes in the way Americans live their lives. And many businesses in these industries were consolidating and combining to create ever larger companies, with the railroads starting this trend, which was then copied by many other industries. Two specific forms of business consolidation were developed that helped to create some of the large monopolies of the era. John D. Rockefeller, the owner of Standard Oil, practiced what came to be called horizontal integration, whereby he bought out all the other competitors in the oil refining industry that he was competing against, thus eliminating his competition. By the late 1880s, Standard Oil controlled almost 90% of the oil refining industry. Essentially, he formed a monopoly and could increase prices, and therefore his profits, without needing to improve the actual product. The other form of business consolidation was vertical integration, as illustrated by Andrew Carnegie's steel company, Carnegie Steel. He started with just the manufacturing of steel, but quickly began buying up companies that handled other parts of the overall steel production, from the extraction of the ore, to its transportation, to the smelting, the refining process, and the delivery to the customer. By owning every step of the process, the Carnegie Steel Company eliminated middlemen and saved more of their profits for themselves. Vertical integration, as this is called, is when a company essentially is acquiring all of the complementary industries that supports its business. That does mean complete domination of the industry with little room for competition. Other methods of business consolidation focused more on the management and financial structure of the companies. Some companies had what were called interlocking directorates and trusts. This often made it appear as if there was competition, when there really wasn't. An interlocking directorate set up a looser ownership structure in which supposedly competing companies shared members of their board of directors, usually with a larger corporation putting their people on the boards of smaller companies they were buying out. Those people would guide the smaller company to not compete with the parent company, even though to the consumer, it technically looked like there was multiple companies involved. They could set prices as high as they wished in order to make the most amount of profit and also push out any other competition that they might have inside the same industry. These practices stifled competition and a lack of competition on the market leads to higher prices for consumers. Trusts were a form of monopolies first created by John D. Rockefeller Standard Oil, where individual shareholders conveyed their shares to a trust headed by a board of trustees, effectively combining many corporations into one. He did this in response to state attempts to regulate out-of-state corporations doing business in their states, mostly focusing on different taxation laws. Financier J.P. Morgan created what's called a holding company as another type of business consolidation. This was a company that held many different companies inside of it. And of course, they worked in tandem so that all of the business actions that happened within each company was actually working for the greater good of the holding company. And of course, all of these were detrimental to the consumer and beneficial to the pockets of the corporations. Many of these business leaders involved, Rockefeller, Carnegie, Vanderbilt, Morgan, etc., would be labeled as captains of industry because they were responsible for the increased production that helped the U.S. economy become one of the largest in the world. Others called them robber barons, which was essentially the same idea, but the first had more of a positive viewpoint, and the second had more negative connotations. You can decide which label is more appropriate. Increasingly, these industries grew so big and powerful that they began looking outside the United States for more market opportunities and resources. They looked to the Pacific Rim and Hawaii, as well as Latin America, for resources to expand their businesses. They imported sugar and rubber from Latin America, sugar and fruit from Hawaii, 
and saw the potential for a market to sell finished goods in Asia. And where business leaders' attention went, eventually so too did the U.S. government, which sought to build an overseas empire, first ousting the monarchy in Hawaii, because Queen Lilukalani wanted to reduce the influence of foreigners in the Hawaiian government, and tariffs on imported sugar affected the price on those goods coming from Hawaii, even if the companies producing them were American. We will focus more on this in the next era, but know that industry leaders essentially were part of the motivation for the U.S. building that overseas empire in the first place. Okay, well that about covers what you need to know about topic 6.5 and the rise of industrial capitalism. Be sure to keep up with your reading, and I'll catch you in the next video.